Thank you, everybody, for coming to the Aaron Torres Podcast YouTube page. If you could do me a quick favor, see that little subscribe button at the bottom of your screen? Go ahead, click that subscribe button. Really does help our channel grow, our audience grow, and I really do appreciate it more than you know. So click that subscribe button. Appreciate your support. Now, here's the video that you came here for. Switch gears, and I do want to get to some college hoops. Now, we will get to the Tuesday night results here momentarily and even a little bit of what happened on Monday night when both Carolina and Kansas won at home on the first big Monday of the year. But I do want to start with some off-the-court news as for the first time this year, we have a job opening at the power conference level. Well, power conference, at least if you consider DePaul to still be a power conference school, but that is right, on Monday afternoon, DePaul officially parted ways with Tony Stubblefield, their head coach. Um, and basically I hate to say it, but his regime basically went exactly the way that really pretty much every other coach of my lifetime at DePaul's went overall goes 28 and 54 overall. That's a 34% win percentage, nine and 38 in the big East. That is a 19% win percentage. I'll be honest. That feels high to me. I don't remember them winning one out of every five games while Tony Stubblefield was the head coach in big East play, but regardless, he is out. And so the conversation becomes, who is next? Now, listen, we're not going to spend a ton of time on this. It's freaking DePaul. But I do want to hit on it for a few different reasons. One, it is a coaching opening. Everybody loves the carousel. And two, DePaul is kind of an interesting job where it's certainly getting, uh, there, there are certainly fewer and fewer people that remember DePaul's heyday and remember DePaul being relevant. But this is a school that has been to multiple Final Fours they went to a bunch of Sweet 16s and Elite 8s in the 70s and 80s. So there are some of you listening that remember DePaul being a national player. Now, again, it's been a long time. I mean, I am I'm I'm I was born in the mid-80s and I barely remember DePaul being relevant. So so that shows you how long it's been. Um, but it's an interesting job. And I why I want to talk about it is because it's kind of a fascinating job from the dynamics of current college sports. And really the push-pull, right? It used to just be history and tradition and where you located. It is a totally different deal now. And I think DePaul is a great microcosm for that. Matter of fact, before we even get to candidates, I think you can argue it is a much tougher job today than it was the last time it opened in 2001. Or 2021, excuse me. That was when they hired Stubblefield. Bottom line is 2021, first off, the Big East was good. It ain't what it is right now, okay? I mean, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say virtually everybody is either in as good or better position than they were in 2021. UConn, obviously, Dan Hurley has them rolling at an elite level. Uh, Rick Pitino is now at St. John's. Ed Cooley, we think, will elevate Georgetown. Sean Miller is a monster to coach against Xavier, even though they're struggling. Thad Mata at Butler, on and on. So the Big East is tough. Beyond that, this is the important part. This is an NIL collective sport now, even in a way that it wasn't in 2021 when the job opened. 2021, we're kind of at the beginning stages of NIL. Nobody really knows what a collective even is. Uh, beyond that, I can tell you for a fact, Illinois state laws at the time were very restrictive on what you could even do in NIL. Well, clearly the last three years that has completely changed, and now it is about, especially the power conference level, do you have cold, hard cash? And DePaul is a school that, that at least on the surface doesn't appear to have a ton of it. So the number one thing is, can you get between the AD Dwayne Peavy was previously at Kentucky as both Mitch Barnhard's right-hand man and also John Calipari's right-hand man too. Can you raise those funds? Can a coach help raise those funds? Because that's all that really matters. And so it's crazy to think about. I would even argue, and I promise we'll get to candidates in a minute. I would even argue... It's the, the candidate list isn't even as good as it was a few years ago. Now, a few years ago, there was a lot of buzz about Kenny Payne, who obviously ended up at Louisville. Obviously, that would not have worked out well. But what I don't think a lot of people know, DePaul, this is a fact. I know it for a fact, multiple sources, multiple you know people, whatever you want to say. DePaul was really far down the, down, down the, the, the stretch with John Shire. They, they really were like this close to getting John Shire as their next head coach. Um, what I can tell you is that the administrate, the administration liked him. He wanted the job. He is from Chicago and the highest of higher ups at the school basically said, no, they basically said, look, we actually don't want to bring in a Chicago guy because 
if you bring in a Chicago guy and it doesn't work, it's going to be hard to fire him. There's a lot of factions in the city and in the alumni and in whatever, kind of like hiring an alum. Like if Michigan has to try to fire Jawan Howard this year, good luck from a public perception standpoint. Obviously, Georgetown went through a little bit of this. So I can tell you they really like John Shire. They were actually, there was some serious, you know, a little, little whatever with Dennis Gates, who's now at Missouri. Uh, didn't work out, you know, from what I've been told from both sides. It just wasn't a, a perfect fit at that moment in time. But I bring it up because those candidates would have been great. Unfortunately, neither of them happened. And now you got to regroup and try to do it in a much tougher Big East and in an NIL world that is unlike what it was a few years ago. Now, in terms of names, let me start by saying this. I think the best name out there is one that is, they are not going to pursue. I think it's Will Wade. I really do. And Will Wade is obviously the coach. Everybody knows got fired from LSU a few years ago, NCAA violations. But he's now back at McNeese State, which is in Lake Charles, Louisiana. I don't know how many people know this. McNeese State basically won at the buzzer on Monday night to improve to 17-2 and two overall this season. And so I know Will Wade has a reputation that precedes him and he got caught on wiretap and blah, 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 this and that. What I can tell you is that reputation is largely... I would say not accurate based on people that I've talked to who have worked for him. He is one, a basketball nerd and he is not, he, you know, people think they have this perception of, Oh, he paid this. He did that. He did that. Dude is a tireless recruiter. I know for a fact when he got a job, when he got that job at McNeese, he basically rented out an Airbnb, brought his assistants. They all lived there for about six weeks and they were just on the phone all day recruiting every single day from sunup to sundown. And so I just bring it up because I truly believe he is a guy that will come in and he will get talent. By the way, for anybody who thinks, oh, he just he just bought a bunch of players. First off, do you see how many players from LSU are in the NBA right now? Trenton Watford, Cam Thomas, uh, whoever. I can't think of everybody. But on top of that, they also have a lot of guys, Nas Reed, by the way, a lot of guys who weren't highly rated recruits. Tari Eason is in the NBA right now. He was a first-round pick out of LSU. Um he averaged six points a game at Cincinnati the year before he got to LSU. Will Wade turned him into a first round. So Will Wade is a great recruiter, a national recruiter. He's not tied to one area. He was kind of in that Virginia VCU era, area, excuse me. Then he goes to LSU. Now he's at McNeese. I think he'd crush it there. Unfortunately for DePaul fans, I don't really buy that he's a real candidate. Um, I don't want to say that I know Dwayne Peavy well, the AD, but I know him a little bit. And more importantly, he kind of comes from that Mitch Barnhard school of AD. In other words, Mitch Barnhard is a very risk-averse AD. Ask Kentucky fans. They've been frustrated with Mitch Barnhard about some of his NIL decisions. They feel like Kentucky fell behind because of their administration. Um, you know, some other decisions that he's made, his relationships, whatever. So Mitch Barnhard conservative AD, Dwayne Peavy. I, I don't see him taking the plunge on Will Wade, even though I think he should. After Will Wade, listen, there's a couple interesting names. I've seen a lot of Bob Hurley. Now, the reason for that, people have been asking me, Bob Hurley from Jersey, played on the East Coast. Um, and I think there was a time, including when this job opened up a few years ago, he was ready to get back to the East Coast. Now, a couple things have changed. One, team's actually doing pretty well. Two, he did not get along with his AD at all. Ray Anderson, you can look it up. You can Google it. Um, him and Ray Anderson hated each other. Like, it's not even a personal, private thing that nobody knows about. It is public. Just Google it. I believe there was an incident where, like, a booster kind of was a little inappropriate with Bob Hurley's wife, and the AD took the booster's back, not Bob Hurley's back. Well, that AD is gone now, and with him gone, I do wonder, you know, is he happy at ASU? And then the other thing is his brother's at UConn and his brother's crushing it. You want to go into a league where your brother's going to beat your brains in twice a year? So I, I don't really think Bob Hurley's as much of a candidate as he was a few years ago. And then from there, you just start talking about a tier of candidates that I don't know how exciting it is going to be for, um, for DePaul fans. First of all, um, any sitting power conference head coach like, just cross them off, okay? Like I even heard some like Chris Be would Chris Beard go there from Ole Miss? Chris Beard is not leaving Ole Miss for DePaul, okay? Nobody likes deep dish pizza that much to go to DePaul from Ole Miss in the SEC where you have unlimited money as much as you need, whatever. I also think, by the way, there's some uh, mid-major jobs that are better than DePaul is. Like Bryce Drew at Grand Canyon. Grand Canyon is a great mid-major job. 
Grant Canyon has better facilities than most of the Pac-12. I don't think he's leaving uh, Grand Canyon for a long time until he gets the perfect job opportunity. So I don't think he's a candidate. Um, I do think some of those Missouri Valley guys are candidates. Uh, Brian Wardell from uh, from Bradley is a name that I've seen. He's he's made it multiple NCAA tournament appearances uh, at Indiana State. I think the name to keep an eye on there, Josh Schertz. He is a guy that had a ton of success at the D2 level, uh, made several D2 Final Fours, and has gotten to Indiana State. Indiana State is 16-3 and three right now. I think he's the kind of guy that you actually probably want because he's proven he can build programs at lower schools, lower resources, not a lot of resources. He's a coach's coach. He can coach. You got to ha- you got to build a staff that can help him get some players, but I think he's a guy that you can build a program with. And I also think coming off of uh, Tony Stubblefield, I don't see the scenario where you can hire kind of a, the, the young assistant coach because that's a little bit of what Tony Stubblefield was coming from Oregon. Really quickly, I am curious, you know, again, I said no sitting Power 5 head coach will take the job, Power 6 head coach. Do wonder if like a a Mountain West type coach would. Nico Medved from Colorado State. Uh, Colorado State's awesome. They're going to make the tournament. Question kind of like Bryce Drew. I think you can argue Colorado State's maybe the best or second best job in the Mountain West. Are you going to leave the second best Mountain West job for the worst job of the Big East? Oh, by the way, on top of that, and I think this is worth noting, Nico Medved went to Minnesota. I think Minnesota is probably going to open up here in a few weeks. Does he wait for his alma mater? Maybe Leon Rice from Boise State. They've made multiple NCAA tournaments. He's talked to, you know, there's been buzz about him getting out of there for a while. But this is one, man, I'll tell you, I don't envy Dwayne Peavy because like I said, I think you can argue this is maybe the toughest job in all of college basketball or in all of the, the, the power conferences. The NIL is going to be a factor. The Big East being a monster is going to be a factor. And I hate to say it, I'm not trying to ruin the buzz for DePaul fans. I think it's going to be hard to find a name that everybody's excited about. Now, the good news is Dwayne is super plugged in, super smart, knows people. Um, I do think there is a possibility that he pulls a rabbit out of the, out of his hat that nobody is expecting. But it'll be interesting to see, man. It'll be interesting to see DePaul in the Big East. We'll see who their next head coach ends up being. But like I said, I do not envy him.